Let's give our praise to the Lord. Let's thank him for his goodness and his mercy, which endureth forever. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, for he is great and greatly to be praised. Amen, amen. So thankful to be in God's house and to feel the presence of the Lord that we feel here today. Amen. We'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And while you're turning there, let me say that I'm so thankful for all of our guests and visitors that are here today. We're so appreciative of your participation in this service. And um, if you've never been to a Pentecostal church, it's a great deal of fun. Uh, there's a lot of surprises in every service. Amen. Amen. You just got to learn to love it. You got to kind of become spiritually childlike, you know. Uh, most of my adult life until a few years ago, I ate cereal every night before I'd go to bed about three in the morning. I'd be getting ready to go to sleep and I couldn't go to sleep without a bowl of cereal. And I love fruity pebbles. I just, I love fruity pebbles. And, and I like fruit loops and I like cereal that has surprises in it. I don't know, they're dumb surprises, but I don't know, I'm, it's the kid in me. So my wife's gonna get me healthy a few years ago and this brand stuff showed up. I know Andrew Bentley up there shaking your head at me. I can barely see you in the lights, but I see your head go like this. It's, the brand doesn't bother me, it's just there's no toys in there. <laughs> I like surprises. That's why I'm a Pentecostal. I like God to show up and surprise me. Amen. I love God to do his thing, and I love to be surprised by his goodness. So don't be alarmed if, if you see things, hear things, experience things in Pentecostal church and think, that's never been in my box before. Yeah, don't worry. We're, Jesus said, except you become as little children. Right? You've got you to gotta have a certain love with the surprising effect of God's Spirit. And I love Him, and I love the way He moves among His people. Ephesians chapter 6, and um, he's talking a bit about the armor of God, the warfare that they will go through. He gives a, a bit of context here in uh, verse number 10, 11, 12, and 13, he starts telling you how to survive different parts of the storms and battles. But he says in verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the tricks or the, the attacks or wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand and to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the blessed breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all attentiveness or perseverance and supplication for all saints. Lord bless you. You may be seated today. I would like to um, spend the next few minutes talking to you about one portion of the text that I read in your hearing. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15 says, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, I read the whole armor deal there, not because there's weeks, if not months, as you know now, I can draw it out a while. 
I could take months and preach on that text. And we'll probably come back as the Spirit leads and, and pick up different parts and pieces of the armor. But the part that I want to specifically deal with today is verse 15, that your feet be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The, the idea that warfare is a part of the Christian existence and experience is not novel. It is not new because uh, the work of the Spirit has often been involved in spiritual warfare. And as you are filled with the Spirit, it is no surprise that evil spirits would want to attack you. But you must understand, as we talked about Thursday night, the attack isn't against you. It is the, against the Spirit in you. It's not personal. It's, it's oftentimes not even about you. Somebody will just take uh, a hateful position to you, and it's not really about you as much as it is about something they feel from you that they do not like. Spiritual warfare is something that is all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and 2, you have the idyllic creation of God. You have this garden who in its nature was idyllic in its circumstances and situations. And you have the entrance of a serpent. And when the serpent enters in, he seeks to destroy. He seeks to bring down, to kill, and to destroy. And God cursed the serpent, which we know because of later work in Isaiah and later works in the New Testament. We know through Paul's teaching that that serpent was Satan. And God curses him in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 14 and 15. And verse 15 of Genesis 3 says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And it, what it? The seed, the child, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so this is a first mention of the gospel, that there is a battle between that which is created and that which is the fallen. And it is doing everything that it can to devour, to bring the created against the creator. And this battle is laid out in the word of God. And God gives us this prophecy that the snake, the serpent, Satan, is going to bite the seed's heel. But the, and that will be a crippling wound. It, it's not... It says that it will bruise him. And it didn't say that it is going to be dismissed and, and not paid attention to. It says it will have a marginal effect. But he said when that seed of yours, when he backs himself onto the head of Satan, it will crush his head. What is crippling to the seed, the seed will in turn rend and give a mortal wound to Satan. And you can go read about this in the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, where the Bible says, And I saw an angel come out of heaven with a great chain, and he bound Satan, the dragon, and he bound him for a thousand years and cast him into hell and cast him into the pit. And so when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. That may be in my past, but I know what's coming towards you. You may, you may know what I've done. You may know what I've said in my past, but I know Satan's future. He will be bound. He will be crushed. He will be demoralized. And so the concept of the foot is very strong theology throughout the Bible. Your feet have a strong um, impetus to the gospel relation. And where you put your feet is not just where you walk. Where you put your feet is what you're taking dominion over. It's what you're claiming in the spirit world. It's what you're appropriating to yourself. 
And so that's why Jesus never sat still very long. But he was walking. He was moving. He didn't say, sit down and listen to me. He said, take up your cross and follow me. To discipleship must include followership. It must include the concept of, I go where he leads me. And so because there's a battle and in my feet, uh, see in, in Genesis chapter 12 and chapter 15, he tells Abraham, everywhere you put your feet, uh, I'm going to give it to you as an inheritance. And so it's already inculcated in the text and in the overarching themes of the Bible that your feet are bringing something. And that is why you can see someone's movement, direction. You can read their body language. You can read what it is. If you see someone running at you, you just automatically kind of want to go like this. It's a natural thing. Because you're reading their footsteps. Um, if, if you, that's why when you see someone racing furiously to you, the prophet did this. He looks out and he sees the woman coming and she's riding fast and he sends his messenger, go, go find out. Is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? You know, he, he must have been married to someone he had to preface things with. You know that text that comes and says, can we talk? You're like, oh dear God, help me to pray. Is this, how do I answer this? If I say no, then I, it could be worse. If I say yes, it could really go bad. This could be all day. What, what do you mean talk? Not really, but you know what I'm saying. Because the way you walk has an impetus to it. It has, a, it has verbiage to it. It's sending a message. And so what you can find in this is the Bible says that you are to arm yourself with these things. And he says, here's what I want you to put on your feet. I want you to put not your own agenda, not your own ambitions. I want you to put the gospel of peace on your feet. Because this prophecy out of Genesis 3.15, this first gospel reference is in your feet today. It is your job with Jesus Christ to bruise Satan and crush his head. And so if, 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 you, if you're holding up a little bit in skepticism and saying, uh, prove that to me, I'm, I'm glad to do so. Let me get to the text that will get you to join me on this. R Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. This God of peace, this God of proclamation of healing and this God of miracles and this God of might, he is going to attack Satan by using your feet as well. Because when you're baptized into Christ, uh, you wear Christ uh, and what Christ crushes, uh, you crush. And what Christ bruises, uh, you bruise. Uh, and what Christ brings peace to, you bring peace to. And so this is all throughout the scriptures. And you can find this in Romans chapter 8, uh, Romans chapter 5. He's teaching us and telling us that the gospel is going to live out a very real existence in you. And so when he says this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6... For when ye were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. He said, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Here's the gospel being preached again to us uh, that I'm going to save you. I didn't come to destroy you. I didn't come to banish you. I came to tear down the middle wall of partition and we could have communion again. We can have fellowship again. That's the essence of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 5, 17, to wit, God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself. Verse 19, and to you is committed the ministry of reconciliation. What is he saying in this? He is saying that the gospel is in you. The power of the gospel is in you to distribute it, to live in it, to appropriate it to yourself. We are not warmongers. We are not bitter. We are not holding grudges. We are not fighting earthly battles. We bear the representation of a spirit world uh, that says peace on earth, uh, goodwill toward men. One of the most intriguing scriptures of the Bible to me, because of its oddity, it is truly paradoxical. It is a deep conundrum in which I fight and wrestle with in my own spirit. Um, and I, I, I can only get it when I take it apart and study it out in bite-sized chunks. But when I put it together as a whole, it's still a bit perplexing to me. So allow me to take a bite out of it. And where I have revelation, I have revelation. But I don't have revelation on the rest of this chapter. 1 Kings chapter 2 is a perplexing chapter to me. A mighty man of God, David, a prophet, a, a patriarch, a, a king, and one that blurs the lines. See, Israel wasn't allowed to have a king and priest. But David was one who blurs the lines. And I think the first time that blur the line thing ever showed up in my life, I was preaching through kings and in and, and Ukaipa, and I, I saw how David was a king, but he'd blur the lines and become a prophet. He was a prophet, but he'd blur the lines and offer sacrifice. He was, he was one that was letting God just take over every area of his life. But in this deathbed experience, David pretty much dies like the godfather. And he gives out a, a hit list on his deathbed to Solomon and says, here's the guys you got to take them out. And here's the guys you got to kill. And don't let their head go down. Uh, don't let their head go to the grave just with gray hair. You, you, you let it go down bloody. Don't let them die old men. And one of the men he picks out was his, was his cousin. And, and, and he, he, this is baffling, or I'm sorry, his nephew uh, is baffling to me because Joab and him had, had worked through all of this together. But Joab had crossed a line. See, there's a difference in blurring a line and crossing a line. We'll get to that one day. But David was blurring the lines for God and Joab was crossing the lines for Satan. And Joab did something when he should have been an operable voice of peace in the kingdom. He does something and David remembers it in verse 5. And he says to Solomon, Moreover, thou knowest also Joab the son of Zariah did to me and what he did to the two captains of the hosts of Israel, unto Abner the son of Israel, of, of Abner the son of Ner, and unto Amasa the son of Jether who he slew and shed the blood of war in peace and put the blood of war upon his girdle and about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to thy wisdom and let not his gray head go down to the grave in peace. So David brings out this instance of this man Joab and said, I want you to kill him. Because when he should have been a voice of peace, he put the blood of war in his shoes. Joab was so bitter. Joab was so violent. Uh, Joab was so despicable in the nature and in what he was doing in his own spirit and heart uh, that Joab, when everyone else was trying to bring oneness and unification to the kingdom, Joab put the shoes of war on. And so in those days, you would bloody yourself with either your enemy's blood, if you could get it, or you would take your own blood as a blood oath, uh, and you would smear it on your sword or on your garment, uh, and you would smear it on your feet. And what that would be was every day you'd put your shoes on, there was blood in his shoes. 
And so when he was tying them, which in those days was a sandal, but he must have smeared that blood on the sole or on the, the footpiece of that. And every day when he was latching his shoes, uh, there was a reminder, get them. Get your bitterness to live uh, and get your grudge to be taken uh, and, and make sure you execute vengeance. And so God moves on David to say, because he only remembered his grudge uh, and he never saw my grace, uh, don't let his head go down in peace. And so here you have an illustration of the opposite or the antithesis of what Ephesians 6 is. The antithesis of Ephesians 6 uh, is when I live with the shoes shod uh, for my own vengeance or for somebody did me wrong or for I have been wounded and I'll get them back or they'll never, ever, ever outlive my suspicion of them. That is the judgment of war that you place on your shoes. But God moves on this patriarch, David, who says on his deathbed, if he has bloody shoes, bring his head down to the grave with that same blood. And so Solomon does so. And Joab, we know the story, runs to the altar and he grabs the horns of the altar. And Solomon says, I don't care. You haven't never prayed your whole life. You've never lived in the altar. I'm not going to live with your regret and your regrets and vengeance and grudge. And he takes his life. And this story is, is meaningful to me because my feet get shod with something. And your feet get shod with something. But as a Christian, you, you should put the blood of Jesus in your boots. And every day you're shooing yourself. You're walking out saying, I got a job to preach peace in the world today. And people do these things and make decisions. But Isaiah 52 and 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of them that bring good tidings and that publish peace. That bringeth good tidings of good and publisheth salvation. And that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. Uh, there's an ancient prophecy in this Bible that says there's coming someone. Uh, and when he gets here, his blood uh, is going to be in his shoes. Uh, but it's going to make you one with him. It's going to forgive you of your sins. It's going to wash your sins away. This is the essence of the gospel that he would reconcile you to him. The power of this is you say, you say, well, I have things in my life. It doesn't matter. Don't be afraid of God. Don't be afraid of what he's trying to do to you today. Don't be afraid of how he's trying to interact with you and what he's trying to do. He brings peace into your life. He brings holiness. He brings love. He brings the anointing of the Spirit of God that walks in here and says, all your life you've been running because you don't know what someone's deal is or what their agenda is. You ever been around someone who's a salesman and you don't quite know when the hammer's going to drop and they're, you know, they're asking you, how you doing, man? Nice haircut. You know, I'm always suspicious when they start that stuff. You know, and you're like, man... And, you know, they're, they're lathering it on, but you can see the vacuum cleaner right behind them. You know the sales pitch is coming. And you're like, look, dude, just get to the deal, you know. And so people get that way with church. They don't know what our game is. They don't know what our angle is. They don't know what, what's, your, what's your deal that you're trying to work. What's your angle? And all the while, I, I want to just tell them, I, I don't have an angle except God. I don't have a deal except God. I don't have an answer except God. And the gospel of peace is in my shoes today. And every time I walk in the pulpit, it's how do we get people uh, to be one with God? How do we get people to not be so afraid of the generational curses uh, and the spooks that are in their family? And they say, oh, this has been in my family for years. Uh, amen. But when you walk in a Pentecostal church, there's a God that starts moving towards you. And the first reaction is, whoa, what are you doing? Uh, but if you could ever see his feet, uh, there's nail scars on those feet. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of my peace uh, is in his feet. Uh, and when I see him coming, it's redemption. When I see him coming, it's love. 
When I see him coming, it's holiness. Stand with me this morning. When I see him coming, it is the victory of everything that I'm afraid of. And in our spirits and in our minds, the anxiety of if I go and I step out and begin to pray and I begin to yield myself to God, what if I turn my life completely over to him? What if I quit resisting him? What if I quit being so afraid? And What if I quit being so nervous about what he's doing? If you could ever see his feet. If you could ever see the blood-stained print that makes its way towards your broken world. And the part that you're hidden, the part that's so deep inside that nobody knows, the wrestling's in the spirit world the fight within the battle within your heart the last great battlefield is right here between your ears the anxieties the stresses the old stories that grandfathers told and now their grandchildren think that they're harnessed with generational curses the stories that come from those that are in certain parts of the world in North America. Oh, you're from this part of the country, you stubborn thing, you. Yeah, we know your kind. You're from this area? Oh, man. Boy, they're hard to win. And there's parts of the United States that home missionaries don't even go because Oh, man, that northeast section, nobody wants the gospel. First Nations left to deal with generational things without a missionary, without a minister. But what would happen if you put the blood of Jesus in your shoes? And every day you shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's an old song they used to sing. When you see me coming, I got Jesus on my mind. When you see me coming, I got him in my heart. I got him in my mind. And the secrets of your life, the private online addictions, the private fears, the terrors of the night, the fear, the nerve-wracking anxiety, the nail-biting days that produce sleepless nights and more lonely days. The anorexia, the obesity, the online addictions, the suicidal impulses and urges, the d depressive and oppressive lonelinesses, the miseries you have when you should be happy. And so you become too afraid to say I'm miserable for fear that someone would rebuke you because you ought to be happy. And so we hide. And so we suppress it. And a preacher comes and opens this great book and everything in hell says, what's his angle? What's his deal? But what if there was nothing in my shoes today except the gospel of peace? What if I got up this morning and everyone in this church, why is this church so friendly? Why are these people so nice? Why do they wanna meet us? Why do they wanna be with us? Why do they wanna buy me coffee? Why do they wanna get together? I don't know what they want. What if they're sinners whose lives was a wreck and Jesus justified them by his blood and that blood got down in their shoes and now every day they go and meet somebody they just want to brag about how good Jesus is and tell them about how wonderful his mercy is. That's what I'm preaching to you today. If you're afraid, if you're worried, if you... If you have problems in your life and you're looking down at your shoes going, oh God, 
Why do I have the blood of Joab, the blood of old regrets in my feet? I'm telling you, Jesus is offering you the blood of the cross. You want a ministry today? Come and let blood be put in your shoes. And when you get up on Monday, man, you're thinking right. With a minute you go to get that first cup of coffee or that first uh, organic broccoli shake or whatever it is you drink in the morning and you open your Bible and the Lord speaks to you and says, today, you're going somewhere. Where am I going to go? You're going to preach the gospel. Why? Because I need you to go. Because I got to crush this serpent. And I'm going to do it with your victories. And I'm going to do it with your testimonies. And I'm going to do it with your wins. And I'm going to do it with your love. Come on, let's lift our hands together right now and ask the Lord, would you put the gospel of peace on our feet? Anoint our actions today. Anoint our minds today. Anoint our spirits today, God. Come on, I invite you to this altar today. If you want to talk to Jesus, if you want to take off some bloody shoes that's got some old crusty battles, some old things that the devil's planted in your head, if you've got things in your mind today, why don't you come to this altar and let the ministry pray with you? Let the spirit of revival cleanse your mind. Put on the helmet of salvation. Let your feet have the gospel of peace. Oh, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. You're looking for a fresh start. It's right here in this place today. If you're looking for new hope, Peace that passes all Ministers of the gospel. 